All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to FWMD Live. It is Women's History Month, and today we are chatting about women's reproductive health and also the steps that women can take to protect themselves from long-term problems and live a healthier life. Today, we have medical experts from the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine joining us for our conversation today. And this one will be a very good and informative conversation. But before we get to that, let's start with me. I'm Prescott Stokes III, the Integrated Content and Marketing Manager here at the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine. And today, I am happy to be here with Dr. April Blight. Hi, Prescott. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you guys today. All right. We're excited to have you, Dr. Blight. I just want to let everybody know that Dr. Blight is the department chair of OBGYN here at the School of Medicine. Now, I am also happy to be here with Dr. Kelly Pajita. Hey, good afternoon, Prescott. Good afternoon, everyone who's watching. Thank you for inviting us. Hopefully, this will be a wonderful session. Yes, yes, it will be a wonderful session. Thank you, Dr. Pajitas. I want to let everyone watching know that Dr. Pajitas is the Department Chair of Medical Education here at the School of Medicine. And I am also to, happy to have Dr. Shanna Combs with us today. How are you doing, Dr. Combs? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. All right. I want to let everybody know that Dr. Combs is an assistant professor here at the School of Medicine, and she is also the OBGYN clerkship director at our medical school. Now, if you want to be a part of this conversation, it's really simple. All you need to do is jump in the comments, leave your question for our experts about women's reproductive health, and then I will definitely get you some answers. But before we get to your questions, I am going to start our conversation with Dr. Blake. So um, Dr. Black, we're gonna just begin this discussion talking about some of the common women's reproductive health problems. So endometriosis and uterine fibroids are two common problems that occur in women um, where they tend to experience pain and heavy bleeding during their menstrual cycles. Uh, does age play a huge factor in the development of, of either one of those problems? Yes, yeah, so age does definitely play a factor in the development of the problems. They occur most commonly in women that are of we call reproductive age. So these are women that are typically in their 20s to their 40s. Each of the conditions is a little bit different. So endometriosis is a condition where you have your endometrial glands, which are the glands from the lining of your uterus located outside of the uterine cavity. And so what can happen is that those glands, if they're in the wrong location, anywhere in the woman's abdominal cavity, maybe on her bowel, near her ovaries, it can cause pain. Um, it can cause pain with intercourse. It can cause infertility ultimately. So it's a condition that typically there's cases where we've documented it in children even. There's cases where women have it after menopause, but most commonly it's during those reproductive years when women are still having their menstrual cycle. Um, uterine fibroids are a little bit different. They are smooth muscle tumors. So they're not cancer tumors, but they are tumors made up of muscle cells similar to the lining of the uterus. They can be really small where women might not even know that they have them. Sometimes they can be quite large and they can cause a lot of pain, abnormal bleeding, um, a lot of pelvic pressure. They can even lead to um, problems getting pregnant or problems maintaining a pregnancy. The interesting thing about fibroids is that they're most commonly cause problems in women's 30s and 40s in the black and black women, they are much more common in the black population and they are also much more likely to cause problems for women at an earlier age. So a lot of black women will, women will develop symptoms in their 20s. It's definitely a factor and they're both can, can be treated or addressed. So it's really important for women to advocate for themselves and let their healthcare providers know if they're having symptoms of any of these conditions so that they can help you work through it and find treatments. Yeah, that's that's really great information, and it's you know it's it's a little bit um, eye opening when you think about you can be on the younger side of that spectrum and and have these problems, which is um, why it's so important even for younger people to make sure they they follow up with their physicians and 
and try to keep their health intact. So we do have some information from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that Dr. Blight has shared with us. We will put a link to that in the comments. So if you have more questions, there's a good resource for you to get information about that. Um, I'm gonna bring in Dr. Pajitas for a second. Um, and let's just talk about a few types of cancers that, that can affect women's reproductive health. So healthcare providers are trying to raise awareness about gynecolic cancer, cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, uh, vulvar cancers. Can you just kind of explain to us what some of the signs may be and how commonly do they begin to develop in women? Thank you, Prescott. That's a, that's a wonderful question. And it's actually, I think, the most important thing with all the gynecological cancers. Um, the one that we know a great deal about, and more importantly, that we can actually screen at, is cervical cancer. So of all the cancers that you mentioned, cervical cancer is the one that we have a fabulous screening tool, which everybody hopefully knows is called a pap test is actually short for Papa Nicolau, who actually is a family member, a um, great, great uncle of ours, um, who actually developed the pap test. So a little, little important, um, but it was revolutionized the ability for us to detect it early on. So the screening test for pap test starts as young as one and can continue even in the postmenopausal years. And how we determine which category and how frequently is really often based on also your risk factors as well. And it's also the cancer that we know has been linked to a common virus called HPV or human papillomavirus. So oftentimes based on the history of the patient, we will determine whether or not that test is as well valuable to include. So cervical cancer, um, because of the tools and prevention is probably the one that we can really detect early on and offer sort of often curative therapies before it gets to a stage when it's extremely serious. The other ones, the uterine cancer, the ovarian cancer, the vulvar cancer and the vaginal cancers are, there is no preventative measure or screening test short of encouraging women to keep their well woman visits yearly. However, oftentimes the most important things for women, and uh, I know we're gonna talk about it towards the end of the session, is being attuned with their menstrual, be in tune with all of their symptoms, especially in the abdominal pelvic area, because oftentimes for both the uterine cancer vaginal cancer, less ovarian cancer, and less vulvar cancer, one of the common symptoms is abnormal uterine bleeding. And abnormal bleeding we often refer to is really can be in between the periods, could be um, at any point in the cycle, but it really is mapped based on what you consider normal versus in terms of your period compared to the symptoms. However, in a patient who stopped having their periods, any type of bleeding, especially in the menopausal years, is really alarming to us. So any kind of abnormal bleeding, if you're not sure, please seek care with your gynecologist, even if your visit is not due for months. It is absolutely very important for us to be able to, um, to, to, to seek care early. Ovarian cancer oftentimes really presents with just bloating or discomfort. And I think that's really important that oftentimes it's probably the have as much ability to detect early on. And um, bleeding is not a common symptom for ovarian cancer. So again, being attuned with your body, knowing when there's some discomfort, some pressure, some pelvic pressure and pain, it's really important. The vaginal cancers and the vulvar cancers are also ex luckily extremely uncommon and rare, but vaginal cancer can present with bleeding. Vulvar cancer can often present with lesions, which oftentimes can be self identified or identify with the providers. So all to say that it is really important for women to keep their visits annually because some of the symptoms are not very pathognomonic except for the screening for cervical. But more importantly, anything that you're not, you're concerned about, you're better off seeking care than just assuming that it's nothing. That is great information, Dr. Pajitas. So we have some links that Dr. Pajitas actually provided to us from the CDC with more about those uh, common uh, gynecologic cancers. And we will put that in the comments and get you more information and some extra resources if um, you, you want more information. And just like, just reiterating what she just said, just, you know, pelvic pain, um, heavy, heavy bleeding. Those are things that you want to kind of stay in tune with. Make sure you get your yearly checkups. Um, and, and just stay in tune with your doctor and, and um, in tune with your menstru menstrual cycle, as Dr. Fajitas just stated. Um, so you can stay on top of those kind of things and, 
and maybe we can catch those cancers before they become anything serious. Um, I just want to reintroduce our topic. This is FWMD Live, and today we're talking about women's reproductive health. It is Women's History Month, and we have been celebrating women all month. Today I have Dr. April Blythe with us, Dr. Kelly Pagetis, and Dr. Shanna Combs with us. So if you have any questions about women's reproductive health, just jump in the comment section, leave your question, and then I will definitely get you some answers. So Dr. Pagetis, I am going to come back to your great uncle because I never knew, you know, I'm walking you know, uh, <laughs> with history uh, right, right, right next to me. That is that is like truly interesting information. Would probably make a great story for our website uh, soon. Um, but uh, Dr. Combs, let's yes. talk a little bit about uh, the human immunodeficiency virus, better known as HIV, that can drastically affect um, women's reproductive health, um, and especially when they are pregnant. Can you just talk to us? a little bit about why it's important for women to know their HIV status. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things with HIV is sometimes you may not have symptoms if you're infected with it. And so knowing your status is super important, especially when it comes to pregnancy, because having HIV um, does not necessarily mean that your baby has to get HIV. When HIV originally um, presented itself, that was one of the, the big concerns is not only how it affected the health of the mother, but that they could transfer the virus to their baby, and then the baby would have it for their lifetime. So nowadays, we almost never see that anymore. Um, because if women are diagnosed with HIV, we have them on uh, medications that suppress um, the HIV virus so that they have almost undetectable levels of the virus, and therefore they don't pass it on to their newborn babies. Um, so it's so important to know your status um, and then be seen immediately once you are pregnant and maintain your medications. Um, and, you know, I think the hardest thing with HIV is you have to be on medications your whole life. Um, and so making sure that you're staying on those medications, keeping your counts down for your health, but also for the health of your baby. All right, that is great information. And Dr. Combs also supplied us with another resource from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We're gonna put that in the comments. So if you need more information about the importance of knowing your, your HIV status, especially um, when you're pregnant, use that link. And that, that can be a very, very good resource to get you some information. Um, Dr. Blake, I, I wanna talk about another common problem, which is interstitial cystitis. Cystitis. I knew I was going to mess it up. I knew I was going to mess it up. You got it. Cystitis. <laughs> Cystitis. <laughs> I, I had been, been practicing. I really practiced. Um, but but actually, it is it is a common thing that is the chronic, um, which is a chronic bladder condition that results in recurring discomfort or pain in the bladder or surrounding the pelvic region. Now, the CDC says that this is a problem that also can occur in men as well, but it tends to affect women more negatively. Um, why is that? And, and what are some of the signs? So um, interstitial cystitis, like you said, it's chronic bladder pain that doesn't have an explanation. So it's, we rule out all the other possible causes like infection um, and it's pretty annoying, frustrating pain for a lot of women. So the symptoms vary. Sometimes people will just have pain when they urinate. Um, some women will have pain during intercourse. Some women have bladder spasms, which can be very frustrating and annoying for them. Um, and then some women will have urgency and frequency. So when they feel like they need to go urinate, they need to get to the bathroom really, really quickly, or they feel like they need to go pee all the time, essentially. And so it can get, it can impact their day-to-day -day life. Some people's symptoms are really, really mild, don't really bother them too much. And then some women are quite debilitated due to their symptoms. There are studies in the United States that show that three to 6% of all women in the US have symptoms of interstitial cystitis. And it is much more common in women than men and um, usually impacts women around their forties. But it is something that if you think that you have, there are things that we can do about it. So if you have these symptoms, you can talk to your healthcare provider. What they're gonna do is they're gonna rule out their possible causes of these symptoms. Cause if it's a urinary tract, infection, for example, they can treat it with antibiotics. But once they've ruled out all the other causes, there's things that we can do with modifications with your diet. Um, we can identify certain triggering factors. Some women, maybe coffee or caffeine or citrus foods are aggravating it. Um, other women 
can um, do pelvic therapy, physical therapy to eliminate their symptoms. So there's a lot of things that we can do, nutritional supplements to help women through it. All right, that's, that's excellent information. Um, I'm just, I want to let everybody know this is FWMD Live that you are watching today. And today we're talking about women's reproductive health. It's Women Histories Month. We've been celebrating women all month. And today, if you have any questions about women's reproductive health, I have Dr. April Blake, Dr. Kelly Pagidis, and Dr. Shanna Combs with us to get you some answers. Um, Dr. Combs, I want to talk to you for a, a second just about polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, now, this tends to happen when a woman's ovaries or adrenal glands produce more male hormones than normal. Um, so for women, what are some of the signs that they may be developing this? Yeah. Um, so this goes to the whole abnormal bleeding. So a lot of times uh, women with PCOS, and we actually see this now even in some of our, our later teenagers as well, um, they'll start having irregular periods where they'll go months without a cycle. Um, and when they do have a cycle, it's very heavy. Um, like you mentioned, they have a extra amount of kind of the male hormones. So they also tend to have a lot more acne. Sometimes they get some facial hair, sometimes some chest hair. Um, and so basically it, um, it's a hormone problem where their periods are not uh, regular and they're not making an egg every month and releasing it. Um, and so it, it, everybody focuses on the cyst part of it when in actuality it's a hormone problem that causes the ovaries to look like a polycyst that have multiple little cysts on it. So all their eggs are getting ready, but they never get released. And so unfortunately, a lot of these women actually really struggle with trying to get pregnant. Um, it can affect um, their fertility uh, chances, but then also later in life, it can cause problems with the lining of the uterus and um, development of endometrial cancer. So it's really important to, again, kind of be in tune with your menstrual cycle. Um, we kind of call it a vital sign in gynecology. Um, it tells you what's going on with your body. And if something is off, then something is off with your menstrual cycle. And so you need to get it checked out. Yeah, that's, that's really good information. And just listening to, to all of you ladies speak about this, you know, the idea of, of pelvic pain, um, abnormal bleeding, um, and being in tune with that and making sure you're, you're talking to your primary care and your OBGYN about it, it just seems to be a common thread with, with a lot of these, uh, these problems, right, Dr. Pajitas? Absolutely. Of course. I mean, I think Dr. Cohn said it wonderfully. It is the vital sign. So for us, everything revolves around a menstrual cycle, including reproduction, ability to get pregnant. But it is really uh, a vital sign because for us, any type of abnormality is really important for patients to seek care. But I also want to preface up saying it's not, I don't want people to be alarmed. It's if there is an abnormality, it's really the ones that persist that we're more alarmed about. But as a patient, you may not know if it's if it's abnormal or not. So that's why we still like to seek care and hopefully give you comfort and reassurance or if we're a little bit more concerned, we can offer all the diagnostic testing that are available to figure out what it is. All right, um, we have a, a, another question. Um, actually, we have a question that, that just came in. And uh, the question is, at what age should a woman stop control pills. Uh, Dr. Combs, do, is that a question you can answer? Yes, it is. Um, so one of, one of the myths that exists out there is I think a lot of women think they can stop getting pregnant at like age 40, um, and that's not true. Um, so uh, basically, you want to stop taking birth control when you can't get pregnant anymore. Um, so the average age of menopause, which is when you usually cannot get pregnant, is around 51. Um, so sometimes in your 40s, um, late 40s, working with your OBGYN or your primary care provider um, to talk about when's a good time to come off of that, um, because we do sometimes see um, uh, pregnancies that weren't necessarily planned um, in the late 40s, because women have the misconception that they can't get pregnant at that age. So um, in consultation with your doctor, um, discussion about when to go off birth control um, depends on whether or not you can get pregnant. All right. Um, and so we have, we have some questions rolling in for, for you all now. So thank you for that question about birth control pills. Um, our next question is, is there an age when HRT is discouraged? I have joint pain as a result of low estrogen and can't eat a regular life without some 
HRT support. So I will open that question up to any one of you lovely ladies. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll answer it. Um, there, there is no magic number. Um, uh, you will hear some people who say, you know, age 65, quote unquote, um, there are risks associated with HRT. Um, and so whenever um, you're placed on it, it's, it's a conversation, a risk benefit conversation. Um, concerns for heart attack and stroke are associated with HRT. Um, but if you have an otherwise uh, health, are in good health and have no other medical problems, um, I think it's a conversation between you and provider. But there's no magic age cutoff um, that exists out there. Okay. And, and Dr. Combs, HRT, what does it stand yeah. for? Yeah, HRT is hormone replacement therapy. So it's basically when you go through menopause, you your hormones go away, um, so to speak. And so hormone replacement therapy is basically to treat those symptoms of menopause. So hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, all the fun stuff that comes with menopause. Okay. Well, that's great information. Thank you for your question. And thank you, Dr. Combs, for that beautiful answer. Um, I want to take a few minutes to talk about um, sexually transmitted diseases, also known as STDs. Now, everyone knows that STDs can occur in men and women, but they tend to have more severe effects in women. Um, Dr. Blight, uh, why is that? And, and also, um, how do STDs affect pregnant women? So that is a good question. A lot of people don't realize that women are a little bit more susceptible in contracting STDs than men, and they also are much more likely to have a delay in diagnosis. And the reason for that, there's a couple of things. One is that um, the lining of the, the vagina is very thin. It's much more susceptible to transmit bacteria and viruses. So during intercourse, a woman is more likely to acquire a sexually transmitted infection as opposed to a man. The other thing is that many of the symptoms of the STDs, um, for example, a woman's symptom, if she has gonorrhea or chlamydia may just be vaginal discharge. Well, that's something that a woman has on a day-to-day -day basis, may not think that it's anything out of the ordinary. Whereas a man, if he has discharge from his penis, he's gonna notice that he's gonna go to the doctor and seek medical attention. Um, it's also harder for women if you have a painless sore, for example, on your vaginal area, you may not necessarily see it. It's going to be much more visible in a man. So a lot of times there's delays in women seeking treatment for their sexually transmitted diseases. And it's important because there can be long-term consequences um, for pregnancy. There can be consequences just in general. If a woman doesn't have her infection treated, she can develop something called pelvic inflammatory disease, which is where the infection kind of moves up into her uterus into her fallopian tubes, and that can impact her ability to get pregnant in the future. It can increase the risk of her pregnancy being located in her fallopian tubes. It's called an ectopic pregnancy. And so that can cause complications. And then during pregnancy, if a woman gets a sexually transmitted disease, um, they can cause problems for the baby. So some of the infections or the viruses can actually transmit through the placenta into the uterine cavity and can infect the baby in utero and mom's abdomen still. Um, the other thing is they can sometimes um, acquire the infection or the baby can the infection in the birth process. And so things can happen, um, for example, blindness can happen in um, infants that are pass through the vaginal canal of a mom that has gonorrhea or chlamydia. You can see um, abnormal brain development as a result of this. Some of women will go into labor preterm and there's even an increased risk of um, in utero or babies passing away shortly after delivery or prior to delivery. So it's really important that women, if they notice any of these symptoms, that they seek, um, seek attention, get treated, and that women are aware of the ways that they can prevent themselves from getting these infection in the first place. All right, that's great information. So yeah, that is, it's good for women and it's also good for-, for Good uh, for men too. <laughs> yes, it is good for men too. <laughs> it is good for men too. Um, Dr. Pajitas, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you about um, sexual violence. Now, I, I, I wanna talk to you about, because funny enough, I was in a um, learning and pondering session, a LEAP session with some of our second year medical students and you were having a discussion with them um, about abortion and, and reasons why uh, women might come to a position and, and 
have a discussion about abortion. And so you did talk about sexual violence during that course with our medical students. So um, it is listed as another danger to women's reproductive health, according to the um, CC CDC. And also it's a significant problem in the United States. Um, so for physicians, what type of resources can physicians provide for women who may have experienced some sort of sexual violence? Well, thank you, Prescott. I think um, the resources are really key, but I think I just want to go back a little bit in terms of what the role of an obstetrician gynecologist does as, as it is well known that for women, we, the OBGYNs, may be their own provider. So we just don't offer care for obstetrics and gynecology. We often provide care even for primary care. So we are their only stop point to be able to provide that. So for us, our responsibility as providers is to ensure and screen these women even before we offer the counseling, because oftentimes um, it is such a um, sensitive topic, oftentimes uh, hard for them to disclose it. So we have an obligation to screen as number one. But part of that obligation is when we identify uh, individuals who have gone through some type of you know, sexual violence, wh whether it's intimate partner violence, whether it's somebody in their work environment, whether it's somebody that is unknown to them, it is absolutely key and important for us to be able to provide resources. And resources are resources for safety, you know, when this occurs or has, whether it's occurred in the past or keeps recurring is that they have the ability to either call somebody or go somewhere where they can seek safety. And more importantly is those resources really need to be available 24 seven. So for us, all of us within our practices have developed these resources in a patient education pamphlet that we can, after we have the discussion with the patient to be able to provide it for them, that they take it with it because oftentimes they may not want to seek care while we actually identify the, the, the issue. And there's tons of resources, even within the greater Texas areas, there's homes, there's, there's individuals, there's counseling sessions, but we are the first stop for patients. And at minimum, they should feel, we should be able to give them that ability to call us and then we can direct them if they don't feel they can directly reach out to the resources we provide for them. All right, that is great information for, for women to have. And I actually wanna kind of, wrap our conversation with, with the idea of women, women feeling pain during normal activities. How important is it for family members, spouses to take, when, when women are not feeling well or they're feeling some sort of pain, to take that seriously and make sure that we help them get effective treatments and get to physicians and, and get control of their reproductive health because when they, we women have so much of a burden on them to be strong and be strong individuals for their families, et cetera. But how important is it that we support them and make sure we, we, we get them help if they need it? I can start Prescott. So I think going back to, especially when we talked about a lot of the symptoms that you heard, even for the gynecological cancers, for the STDs that Dr. That you know, Dr. Blake talked about is because a lot of these symptoms are nonspecific, and some of them we experience as a normal process, whether it's part of our period or it's part of our part of our menstrual cycle. So it absolutely is important, especially if it's continual and persistent. Um, and as I stated earlier, you know, seek help and seek care so somebody can really help you figure out if it's just normal or it's something that we need to be serious about. But really our lifeline is, you know, as Dr. Combs said beautifully, vital sign is our menstrual cycles and discomfort, pelvic discomfort, whatever that is, and, and vaginal bleeding and discharge. Those are the four key things for us as females to be attuned to our bodies, but more importantly, don't ignore things because um, it's very easy, like you said, to be strong and to do it all, but it's very important for us to at least ask somebody for sort of a second opinion or just bounce something off their, off their, off their providers. All right, that was, that was excellent. Very well put, Dr. Fajitas. Um, and that will do it for our FWMD live chat today. I wanna to thank everyone on Facebook for being a part of today's live chat. And I also wanna give a huge thanks to our special guests, Dr. April Blight, Dr. Kelly Pagidis, and Dr. Shanna Combs. Thank all three of you for joining us today for this important discussion. Thank you, it was a pleasure. It was great talking with you guys. <laughs> Hi, I'm April Blyke. I'm the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the TCU and UNT Health Science Center School of Medicine. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel.